Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to CSIS. I'm Ernie Bauer. I'm the Sumitra Chair for Southeast Asian Studies and uh, standing in today for Andy Kutchins, who is uh, out in uh, Eurasia uh, working on, uh, on uh, some new initiatives there. Uh, but he asked me if I would, uh, would stand in, and, and it was a real pleasure to do so because today's discussion is about an important uh, multilateral and security development uh, challenge uh, in Asia, and and what, uh, and I think a very unique uh, approach. And that approach um, is, uh, is has been developed by uh, Kazakhstan, and we are honored today to have the Deputy Foreign Minister uh, of Kazakhstan with us, uh, uh, Yerzan Ashikbaev. Uh, before we start, I'd like to invite the President and uh, CEO of uh, CSIS, John Hamry, to join me here uh, at the podium and, uh, and, and make convening remarks. John? Good morning, everybody. I apologize. I was out trying to track down two of my panelists. And so, I've, uh, uh, welcome. Good morning to all of you. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, I, I'm particularly pleased to welcome the Deputy Foreign Minister uh, to Washington. Now, I will tell you, only a young man can put up with uh, with the travels that he has been assigned. I used to be the Deputy Secretary of Defense. I know what deputies have to endure. You know, we're given all of the hard work, you know, and, and while the boss is back home having fun, right? No, no, you don't have to comment on this, Deputy Foreign Minister, but he's been to Panama, he's been to Paraguay, he's been to Brazil, he's been to Cuba, he's been to Canada, and now America. I mean, oh, this is, this is not diplomacy. This is an endurance contest. This is what, what he's enduring. But a young and very vibrant man can do this. Uh, and I must say, we're very delighted to have Deputy Minister Ashkabayev with us. Um, I, this is a really important topic uh, for us to discuss. I think, first of all, I think we need to put in context the enormous significance of the day we're all living in, uh, which is really uh, unprecedented. If you, if you think about, you know, of course, for, for uh, probably 10 centuries, maybe 20 centuries, you know, the economic dynamic of the world, the crossroads of that economic dynamic were through Central Asia. But then after the rise of the European uh, imperial states, uh, the, the dynamic, uh, good morning, David, uh, uh, the dynamic of global economy shifted dramatically as the global empires pulled the global economy to the coastline. And so all of the commerce of the last 400 years has been dominated you know, by this coastal trade system. But what we're now seeing, this is an, of epochal significance, is the reconnecting of Asia. Uh, Asia is now coming together again, reversing this trend that was started over 400 years ago. And it's a dramatic development. And of course, it centers in Central Asia. And there's no more important country in that region than Kazakhstan. So uh, this is a rare opportunity for us uh, to, you know, to get a ground level view about this dynamic. And of course the government of Kazakhstan is, is championing you know, stronger governance structures throughout this region for this very dynamic. And uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister is going to talk to us about that today for this role that they've been playing in SICA. It's not well understood in America. Deputy Foreign Minister, let me just tell you right now, you are speaking to, well, most of these people are knowledgeable. The people outside, the people that are at the website, the people that are not here don't know a darn thing about SECAD. So you're, you're here for an education purpose, but we will not make you the education minister today, except in Washington. So we look forward very much to your presentation. We think it's going to be a very dynamic morning. Thank you very much for coming. And would you, with you please, with your warm applause, welcome the Deputy Foreign Minister. Mr. Bo, thank you. Uh, 
for your introduction and uh, Dr. Hamri, thank you uh, for your kind words. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, for me to be here. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend our appreciation to the Center of Strategic and International Studies for organizing this event. Uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is uh, the second time CSAS organizes uh, an event for uh, on the conference of, uh, on interaction and confidence building measures in Asia, uh, uh, one of the flagship uh, initiatives uh, of Kazakhstan. And uh, I thank uh, you wholeheartedly for, for this. Uh, I should also uh, uh, thank uh, Dr. Hamry and his team uh, for uh, the valuable research on the region uh, that uh, CSIS uh, conducts, uh, uh, most importantly with the new Eurasia from the Inside Out project. Uh, this is a new effort to identify the paths to greater regional cooperation across Eurasia. And uh, I'm delighted again uh, to be here with you uh, this morning, and I'd like to speak about the opportunities that Kazakhstan sees in this global age as we define our vision for Asia, uh, what kind of Asia we would like to live in in the coming years. So. Uh, uh, I have a very long thesis, uh, uh, a speech, uh, but uh, uh, let me speak uh, with my own words. Uh, first of all, uh, we're all aware of uh, the uh, uh, Asia's pivotal role uh, currently, and uh, uh, we're well aware of uh, pivot to Asia, the uh, uh, different strategies to enhance uh, the uh, cooperation with Asian nations. Uh, Asia, uh, indeed, is uh, becoming increasingly influential in so many respects, and uh, uh, today we're witnessing the uh, uh, revival of the so-called uh, Silk Road, Silk Road, uh, which uh, Dr. Hamri uh, uh, addressed uh, in uh, terms of uh, reconnecting Asia through its uh, uh, land masses, huge land masses that uh, uh, Asia has. So uh, despite all this, Asia still remains a place of uh, complex and contradictory processes, and uh, uh, Asia still is uh, the origin and the location of uh, so many challenges, threats, and uh, risks. Uh, in this regard, we believe that uh, the system of regulation of regional relations uh, uh, needs uh, to be invented. And, uh, well, there are different uh, international forums that uh, has been uh, created recently. Uh, uh, we can name a, a number of them, but uh, uh, traditional, both traditional ones from the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council in uh, uh, the western parts of uh, Asia to uh, ASEAN uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. There are a lot of them. But, uh, and this is an indication that uh, Asia does uh, require coordination and cooperation. So uh, I would like uh, uh, to emphasize several main factors that contribute uh, to the development of uh, the regional initiatives. Uh, first of all, uh, specifics of circumstances in each particular area uh, put more responsibility on the states to abide by the principles of the United Nations and uh, create the atmosphere of uh, trust as this is essential for uh, Asia's uh, future development. Secondly, uh, globalization uh, shows, demonstrates that regional approaches uh, based on uh, principles of uh, mutual respect and trust are becoming guarantee of viability and durability of uh, uh, the states. And thirdly, politically, uh, politically and economically competitive regional structures strengthen the position of the states on uh, the global arena, on the global level. So uh, with this in mind, uh, we uh, can uh, securely state that uh, regional structures in Asia uh, hold a great importance and role. 
So this is where Kazakhstan and uh, President Nazarbayev uh, at uh, the time saw the potential for the conference on uh, interaction and confidence building measures uh, uh, to play as a vital platform uh, for advancing the cause of peace, uh, security, and development throughout the whole uh, region. So uh, the uh, seeker has its uh, specific niche as it uh, concentrates on confidence building measures and its uh, uh, pan-Asian structure. Uh, it, it was foreseen to be uh, the one uh, from the very beginning. So 22 years ago, uh, at uh, his first appearance at the uh, United Nations General Assembly, President Nazarbayev put forward the idea of uh, creating an interstate dialogue platform to uh, develop the confidence building measures. Uh, the moving spirit behind this initiative was the aspiration to set up an efficient and acceptable uh, structure for ensuring peace and stability. And uh, uh, the idea was that uh, Kazakhstan uh, was already a member of the uh, OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which uh, set uh, certain rules uh, uh, of behavior in Europe, while uh, Asia lacked uh, that kind of rule. And uh, uh, from the very beginning, we saw this as an impediment uh, to the stable and sustainable development of Asian nations. Uh, well, that was uh, indeed uh, one of uh, the first international uh, foreign policy initiatives uh, of Kazakhstan. And uh, uh, as uh, in so many initiatives uh, uh, proposed by Kazakhstan, uh, we faced uh, a, a skepticism uh, at uh, the very beginning. And uh, uh, that was a well-grounded skepticism as Asia is uh, the most uh, probably heter heterogeneous uh, 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 continent in the world. It, uh, nation, Asian nations uh, uh, differ from each other in so many respects, uh, be it religion, uh, social economic development, culture, uh, or uh, the views of, uh, 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 on uh, different aspects of international agenda. So uh, SICA process uh, had to be approved in a difficult international environment because uh, uh, the interstate mechanisms that were created during the bipolar world, uh, they turned out to be uh, ineffective uh, to operate in uh, 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 the current uh, uh, environment uh, in uh, the period of uh, uncertainty and in periods of uh, multipolarities. So over the years, SICA uh, uh, member states have done uh, tremendous work, uh, achieved uh, very significant results, we believe. So uh, current SICA, uh, uh, what is SICA now? Uh, you can see it from the map. SICA is uh, uh, truly pan-Asian structure. Uh, it has uh, 26 uh, member states with uh, Qatar and Bangladesh joining quite recently uh, during the uh, fourth SICA summit in Shanghai. Uh, it brings together uh, 26 members, seven states, and four international organizations as observers, uh, including the United Nations, uh, geographically covering 90% of uh, the Asia's territory and uniting more than 3 billion people. And uh, uh, we're, there are a number of Asian nations that, uh, can, uh, that seriously consider joining this uh, club in the nearest future. Second, uh, basic documents uh, uh, have been elaborated and adopted. Uh, one of the most important of them is a catalog uh, of confidence building measures, catalog of CBMs, a comprehensive and unique document in the, in, in the history of international diplomacy, we believe, uh, which became an important uh, milestone in uh, uh, the development of Asian security. So uh, this is uh, a, a real achievement, and it concentrates on uh, five uh, spheres. Uh, this is, those are very 
simple uh, uh, measures, uh, simple uh, CBMs, uh, mainly concentrating on uh, information sharing, consultations, uh, exchange of information, but uh, they are vital for Asia as uh, uh, nothing of this kind uh, uh, was done previously in uh, the context of the whole continent. So uh, the third achievement is uh, the institutionalization process of the forum. Uh, it has uh, uh, certain stages and uh, currently uh, secretariat and uh, uh, some working bodies are functioning effectively and uh, secretariat is uh, uh, to be relocated uh, this uh, coming July from Almaty to our capital city, Astana. Uh, we have also created uh, SICA Youth Council and uh, there is also training and educational center for combating desertification in Asia, which will soon open in Turkey. Uh, as you see, those uh, uh, structures are quite diverse and uh, in, uh, they cover different, quite different areas of interest. Uh, the, fifth, uh, the fourth achievement, I would say, is establishment of a process for enhancing economic cooperation. Uh, the newly established SICA Business uh, Council uh, will become, as we believe, uh, a reliable cooperation framework. So uh, the next step is uh, for SICA to establish uh, cooperation with uh, uh, different uh, Asian organizations and uh, we've witnessed uh, the signing of a uh, memorandum of understanding between SICA and Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, at, uh, the, uh, on the margins of uh, Shanghai Summit. So SICA is a young forum, often moving on unbeaten paths, and uh, it doesn't possess uh, ready uh, recipes for uh, all causes and uh, situations. However, uh, we believe that uh, all the solutions should be uh, elaborated through the dialogue. And, uh, well, uh, we have... Uh, uh, third chairmanship already uh, taking the lead in the organization. We were the first, uh, followed by our esteemed uh, Turkish friends, uh, who's done a tremendous job in uh, uh, furthering SICA goals. And uh, we, will, we are now under the uh, Chinese chairmanship, which uh, took over uh, uh, several weeks ago. And we are looking forward for a uh, uh, a new concept, new concept of uh, Asian security, which was proposed by uh, uh, Chinese leader uh, President Xi, uh, Xi Jinping at uh, the SICA summit. So it concentrates on uh, four main areas, uh, being uh, the common security, where countries should oppose the attempt to pursue one's own absolute security and should assure each other of common existence and recognize others uh, legitimate security concern. Comprehensive security, uh, which uh, is a fight against new threats and challenges. Cooperative security, uh, it's uh, seen as uh, settling international disputes by peaceful means and opposing willful use or threat of uh, use of force. And sustainable security, which is a social and economic development and prosperity of Asian countries. Uh, this is a platform I believe that uh, we will see uh, Chinese chairmanship in uh, SICA to implement in the coming years and uh, we're looking forward uh, to uh, practical steps of uh, the uh, Chinese uh, uh, chairs uh, to implement this vision uh, on uh, throughout the Asia. Uh, one of the notable results of uh, the, uh, uh, the past Shanghai, the fourth Shanghai SICA summit was uh, the proposal by uh, President Nazarbayev to transform uh, the uh, SICA into the Organization for Security and Development in Asia. So this is uh, 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 an analog of o OSCE in Europe, we may say. And uh, if you look back at the uh, 
President Nazarbayev's 1992 uh, UNGA speech, then uh, you can see that uh, this was an original idea to create uh, uh, the uh, OEC-like forum in Asia. Uh, even I have a quote uh, uh, that President uh, uh, was foreseeing as a fourth stage, uh, and I'm uh, quoting him now, uh, would consist of forming a unified transcontinental conference on security and cooperation in Eurasia and creating machinery for permanent interaction between the continental systems of collective security in Asia, Europe, Africa, and the Americas, with the further prospect of setting up a unified global system of collective security and cooperation. And uh, uh, this is uh, taking place, uh, we believe, uh, with the uh, only mistake uh, uh, with the timing, as President uh, Nazarbayev uh, 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 was planning that uh, the approximate time frame would be 2000 to 2005. We are lagging behind that schedule, but uh, we are uh, well on the way to uh, uh, the goal itself. Uh, in depicting uh, Sika, I should also uh, point out to the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The reason being that those two uh, uh, forums uh, were established on the same principles, confidence and uh, trust building between the nations. Uh, we may see uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization as a, a smaller model, uh, though there are a lot of stereotypes around the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization being the uh, uh, military bloc, uh, uh, though it's uh, uh, a universal uh, organization at uh, currently, but it was based on uh, exactly the same principles of uh, CBMs in political and military sphere. The uh, Moscow and uh, Shanghai agreements of 1996-1997 created the conditions uh, for uh, uh, pull out of troops and uh, uh, verification mechanisms between uh, the, for, uh, the nations uh, uh, of uh, uh, former Soviet Union, uh, namely four nations that uh, had a common border with China from one part, uh, which are Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, and the uh, uh, People's Republic of China from the other. So these uh, uh, arrangements, uh, confidence building measures, uh, created the basis uh, for such uh, uh, a successful organization as uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, it is now the organization which not only deals with uh, security uh, issues on uh, its territory, but also with the issues of economic development and the issues of uh, fostering uh, humanitarian uh, cooperation between uh, its uh, member states. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we believe that uh, uh, Asia is undergoing a huge transformation. Uh, Asia is a powerhouse, economic powerhouse uh, of uh, the 21st century. But uh, to make this uh, economic growth sustainable and safe uh, and stable, Asian nations do need uh, uh, rules of behavior, do need uh, the rules of the interaction in uh, 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 the international uh, politics. So SICA is, uh, we believe, is an answer to uh, the challenges. If we can develop SICA uh, as an operational mechanism, which uh, we are trying to do uh, together with uh, the uh, Turkish chairmanship, the Chinese chairmanship, uh, with other member states, uh, we can uh, see uh, much more uh, stable and safe and secure environment in Asia. Uh, and uh, I would also like to uh, underline that though we are proud of being a, a founding nation of uh, the conference, it's now owned by uh, all 26 member countries. Uh, so it's living its own life, 
though we are, of course, this is uh, our initiative and uh, uh, we will be attentive to any uh, development in, uh, 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 in the history of Sika, but uh, it's owned by all member states. Uh, it's developing, it's living its own life and uh, uh, hopefully uh, much, uh, uh, a greater number of uh, Asian nations will join and uh, indeed uh, as uh, this map demonstrates, uh, SIC already has a, a considerable presence in Asia. It's uh, time to expand to uh, Southeast Asia and to uh, 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 to Gulf Cooperation Council countries, and uh, those are uh, future developments that uh, we will see in Sika. By this, uh, uh, I just have uh, one uh, a short remark, which is uh, 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 you may think it as a propaganda, but I can't uh, 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 help uh, myself. Uh, saying that Kazakhstan is uh, running as a candidate uh, for UN Security Council on permanent seat in 2017-2018. And we believe that uh, uh, we are competing with Thailand uh, uh, for the only seat uh, from Asian group. Uh, and we believe that uh, uh, our profile of uh, uh, strong uh, proponent of uh, 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 nuclear disarmament, uh, the strengthening of non-proliferation regime, and our contribution to Asian security by means of SICA uh, are those merits that uh, will be taken into consideration by uh, 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 United Nations uh, member states uh, while deciding their position on uh, our uh, candidature. I thank uh, all of you for your patience. I'm not uh, the best uh, public speaker. Uh, so I thank you and I'm open for any Q&As, uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. And uh, I think we will, uh, if, if we could, we'll, we'll have the panel uh, just, um, respond to your remarks and then we'll open it for uh, for Q and A, and we have a, a distinguished panel uh, to respond to the uh, Deputy Foreign Minister's remarks. Uh, on my on the left of the Foreign Minister is David Sedney. Uh, David uh, served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia, and Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia, and was the DCM or, or Deputy uh, in the U.S. Embassies in Beijing, Kabul, and Baku. Um, Next to him is Ambassador uh, William Courtney, who uh, you know uh, was the former U.S. Ambassador to the Republic uh, of Kazakhstan and a, and a career foreign service officer um, with a distinguished career. And on my far left uh, is my colleague uh, at CSIS, Mr. Bulent uh, Ali Riza, who is the Director and Senior Associate of the Turkey Project here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, we, David, I'll start with you and we'll move down the line for some, some brief remarks and then we'll open it up to, uh, to question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Ernie. <clears throat> and I actually I think it's particularly significant in a uh, discussion like this to have Ernie chairing it because I'm more likely to uh, be at an event where Ernie's talking about Thailand or, or Indonesia <clears throat> or other countries in that part of Asia. And to have Ernie part of this, I think, is, is actually a symbol sitting up here on the stage of the kind of uh, <clears throat> vision that the Vice Foreign Minister talked about uh, that lies behind, uh, lies behind SICA. Um, I have to apologize a little bit uh, because the first part of my remarks were taken by Dr. Hamry, uh, and, uh, but I'm going to uh, uh, persist with them anyway, but I'm going to shorten them a bit. Uh, because I very much believe that he's, he's right uh, from, a, from a, an, a, an era in which uh, political, economic, military power was focused on maritime, the maritime domain. And so the offshore islands for the Eurasian landmass, the offshore islands of Japan and the offshore islands of the United Kingdom were the dominant powers uh, it, during that period of time. That shift uh, back to, uh, in a sense, but I would say it's actually beyond 
uh, the past uh, to dominant land powers, uh, China, Russia, Germany, uh, Europe, uh, some kind of Islamic uh, uh, entity in the Middle East, whatever that uh, turns out to be. That's a, I see that as a long-term historical trend, uh, and I think Dr. Henry, Henry captured it. And it has a lot of major consequences uh, that if you just look at today, uh, you're going to miss. Uh, that, for example, is my critique of the administration's so-called pivot to Asia. Because, of course, it's not a pivot to Asia, because it's a pivot away from one part of Asia, <laughs> uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, which if you look at the map, that's all one landmass. It's actually a, it's, a, it's a movement from one part of Asia to another. So it's not a shift, it's not a pivot, uh, and it's not to Asia because uh, it's all part of Asia. Uh, why, do I, why do I stress that in the term, term of SICA? I think the, the vision uh, that the Vice Foreign Minister laid out, and, and as he correctly pointed out, uh, first enunciated by uh, the President of Kazakhstan, uh, North Sultan Nazarbayev, uh, back uh, over 20 years ago, of a pan-Asian regional uh, organization is one uh, that uh, has so much validity that it's endured despite the huge challenges uh, that SICA has faced and continues to face. Uh, I was in the U.S. State Department uh, when SICA was formed and there was the debate, uh, should we pay any attention to this organization? Should we send anybody to its initial meeting? Uh, and the, uh, the answer was wrong. Uh, we didn't really pay much attention to it. Uh, at a time when we thought we were the world's sole superpower and uh, we were focused on trying to uh, essentially maintain that power, uh, we didn't take advantage of not just SICA but a number of other multilateral organizations. And Ernie's aware of this trend too. And it's only been in the last five or six years that we started branching out and embracing regional organizations. Uh, because, again, I think that original vision that President Nazarbayev laid, laid out of the need for such an organization is very much there. Um, and uh, I'm going to continue to pay, uh, to, to pay tribute and respect to that vision because I think it was accurate, but as the ambassador knows, I will also provide some advice which may not comport entirely with that vision. Um, and uh, and I, as I was listening to the Vice Foreign Minister's uh, description, uh, I was taken by the emphasis on the importance of having it be all of Asia. And I think I would emphasize, particularly in today's climate, uh, the, green the green country uh, uh, on the uh, eastern edge, which of course is Ukraine. And having Ukraine as part of this uh, as an institution, which as the Vice Foreign Minister said, is devoted to peaceful resolution of disputes, I think Ukraine shows that there's a need for peaceful resolution of disputes. Unfortunately, of course, what happened in Crimea was not a peaceful resolution of a dispute. It was a violent, it was the use of military power to take to territory from one country and to give it to another. So that was the use of violence. That was the use of military force to change the map. Uh, and it took place in an area uh, that's on, right now on the edge of where Tsika is. To me, it shows the need for something like Tsika, but something like Tsika to be effective. Uh, and I think those kind of stresses and strains are only going to continue. Uh, and will make the need for Tsika or a similar organization uh, even greater uh, because while I admire uh, the Vice Foreign Minister's emphasis on the role of the UN, I think the role of the UN in resolving disputes uh, in the last 20 years has become questionable. Uh, and I know that certainly in the United States, we don't look to the UN first, second, or third to resolve disputes where we think they're really important. Uh, and that's because of the power of uh, the five veto countries to stop progress on key issues. Uh, and so the UN can't be effective in Crimea. Uh, and we see this, but we see the same trend elsewhere. Uh, in Africa, the role of the OAU has become more and more important. Regional organizations are becoming more important. Regional organizations in Asia have the potential to be important, and which one of them will become uh, most important, I think is still open. I think there's actually competition here. I think Tsika is, in a sense, in, in competition with fora such as uh, APAC, uh, ARF, uh, the, Asian, the East Asian Summit. Uh, a lot of the same people go to the same, th to the same meetings and subscribe to the same objectives, and I think people are looking for uh, an organization that's going to be effective. So if people are looking for an effective organization, and if Tsika has the right broad vision, why hasn't it succeeded more than it has? Uh, and I'm going to offer a couple comments there. The first is uh, the emphasis on state. Uh, in, during a period of time of globalization, 
of time when power has been being diffused away from states. And you see the rise of everything from obviously the power of multinational corporations to the power of individuals uh, that's been, in, it's been emboldened uh, and enhanced by the rise of the internet uh, and uh, uh, the whole cyber world. Uh, the role of organizations beyond states, organiza organiza the roles of organizations and individuals, uh, the uh, elements uh, that are often referred to as civil society, but I would say go beyond that. Uh, that is wh where the future is more and more. That, I think, uh, is where, for example, the Vice Foreign Minister mentioned the creation of the Business Council. But what do doesn't happen at the SICA meetings right now is a parallel civil society kind of fora where groups and individuals, including those that states don't like, that the presidents of China and Russia don't like, are able to go and, and uh, have a voice, uh, criticize what the states are doing, be part of uh, the, d the discussion. That's something that is absent from SICA now. Uh, and if all SICA uh, is going to be is a fora for state leaders to talk about state priorities and ignore the rest of uh, a vibrant and increasingly important uh, part of the community, then SICA won't be effective. Uh, uh, the Vice Foreign Minister, I think, correctly mentioned OSCE a number of times. And the OSC, I thought was, I think, was uh, an, an amazingly important organization in the 1970s and 1980s precisely because it went beyond governments, because it embraced a series of civil society, uh, rule of law, governance sets of agendas that went beyond the traditional state-to-state -state power kind of relationships. In fact, the basic bargain of the OSCE in many ways was that uh, Western Europe essentially recognized the Soviet Union and its role, and in return got promises from the Soviet Union to expand into these other areas, of recognition of rights uh, that went beyond those uh, that uh, had been part of the uh, d dialogue uh, between the West and, and, and the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, so for SICA, our whatever organization becomes the dominant regional organization in Asia to succeed, and I think uh, the others I mentioned have, have the same weakness. Uh, their focus is too much on, on state power and not enough on uh, the emerging er uh, other areas that I mentioned. That's a challenge for SICA. Um, and uh, is it a challenge SICA can, can meet? I think it can. Again, going back to the vision uh, that, uh, that President Nazarbayev laid out originally, I think uh, that vision applies, but it applies to more than just states. Uh, the Vice Foreign Minister mentioned the SCO. Uh, that's another organization that's in the, in the competitive space. But identifying SICA with SCO, I think it would be a huge mistake. Uh, SCO has carried out a number of activities which I would say are counter to the idea that individual states have uh, have, uh, have, uh, have have equal status. Uh, SCO has become dominated by Russia and China, particularly by China in recent years. Uh, and if that's what happens uh, with uh, SICA, if the Chinese chairmanship results in SICA being a China-dominated organization, then it won't be effective. Uh, the uh, role of Kazakhstan in countering that uh, is challenging because Kazakhstan, as I've often been told, is a smaller country between two much larger countries. Uh, Kazakhstan has to balance. Uh, but Kazakhstan, by putting forth the initial vision for Tsik, I think has a responsibility to move it beyond just a, being a pawn of any individual state. Uh, so I think I agree with the Vice Foreign Minister that it's very important that China is taking the uh, chairmanship I think it's a period of great danger for the SICA vision, because at the end of five years, all the other countries see as SICA as a tool of China, then it will have failed. Uh, and uh, I don't think that will happen. I hope it doesn't happen. But I think it's a possibility. So anyway, um, I uh, think I've probably used up a little more than my time, Ernie. I think it's a great vision. I think it has great potential. Uh, uh, I think it captures that geopolitical trend that, uh, that uh, Dr. Hamry uh, mentioned in his opening remarks. Uh, and Kazakhstan's role uh, is hugely important. But just as it can be an instrument for uh, ameliorating the tensions uh, and handling uh, the challenges, it could also end up being something that could be used as a tool to crush others. And that's what I hope doesn't happen. Thank you, David. Uh, Ambassador? Thank you, Ernie. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, 22 years ago, when President Nazarbayev proposed oh, David, you turn your I turn my 
when President Nazarbayev proposed uh, SICA. Uh, I was in Almaty at the time, and we were a little surprised uh, at first that Kazakhstan was so uh, ambitious on the multilateral diplomatic stage at such an early phase of its life. This is less than a year after President Gorbachev had signed the dissolution of the Soviet Union. But as we thought about it, <clears throat> uh, there were several interesting aspects to it. Uh, one, the concern, the concern in Washington and some of the European countries was, is this an OSCE without the humanitarian basket? Which is another way of talking about the civil society dimension that David mentioned, which is so important. And so there were some who, in the West, who were negative toward SICA because it looked like it was an effort to elide the OSCE parameters to move off into something that was more value mutual or value absent, uh, if you will. Uh, on the other hand, for Kazakhstan, if you don't know anything about the countries, but you know that it a, has a vast territory, larger than Western Europe, uh, not very many people, very wealthy resources, what would you expect from a strategic behavior by such a country? That country would want to have close, good relations with all of its neighbors, would want to balance them, if you will, and would want to broaden its diplomatic reach beyond its two great power neighbors as a way of helping to protect uh, itself from uh, potential excess from one or the other great power neighbors. So SICA fit into this perfectly, actually, enabling Kazakhstan to reach further out uh, to develop uh, relationships with other countries in a multilateral setting. Um, as with uh, some activities, though, it took quite a while for it to, to emerge. Uh, but here we are now, two decades later, and suddenly China, one of the great powers of, of the Earth, um, just uh, last month, you know, has really taken ownership of SICA in a way which, as David points out, poses some threats. On the other hand, it suggests that uh, an activity, a multilateral initiative by a small country, at the time a small and poor country, has had resonance now on a much larger international stage. That doesn't happen very often. Most major initiatives start with great powers or, or existing alliances like NATO or, or other things. So from a um, strategic perspective, it was really quite foresighted of uh, Kazakhstan to uh, propose something like this. The um, second aspect I'd like to talk about is the Chinese. As you know, Xi Jinping uh, last month at the uh, uh, SICA uh, meeting proposed uh, converting SICA into a regional security architecture uh, or regional security framework. Uh, and it sounds a little bit like an alliance, the way he talked about it. Uh, for example, uh, in his conception, uh, an upgraded uh, SICA would have, quote, a defense consultative mechanism, end quote. Sounds like Article 4, Article 5 of NATO. Quote, security response center, end quote, for major emergencies. Sounds like maybe NATO rapid response force or, or something else. Quote, a code of conduct for regional security, end quote. Well, that sounds a little bit like sort of what OSCE uh, does to some extent. And then, quote, an Asian security partnership program, uh, end quote. So that sounds like something that, that NATO and uh, NATO member countries do on a bilateral basis as well as within the alliance. That's a pretty ambitious agenda for an organization as diverse as SICA. SICA is incredibly diverse, except for the United Nations itself. I don't know whether there's any other country. I don't even imagine OAU is, is as diverse as SICA is. So that's, that's clearly a very ambitious agenda. Uh, and is that possible for an organization as diverse as, as SICA? A second aspect of Xi Jinping's um, initiative, if you will, Vladimir Putin was sitting there. Putin has championed the Commonwealth of Independent States, the Collective Security Treaty Organization. Xi Jinping spoke as though, if you will, those either didn't exist or were not all that relevant or were yesteryear's uh, security and, and cooperation uh, structures. Up until now, up until that meeting, Chinese would go out of their way when talking about Central Asia, to pay public uh, tribute, obeisance, if you will, 
to Russia's geopolitical role in Central Asia, Russia's special geopolitical role. And China was essentially saying, well, we're only there for economics. But the previous year, as you know, he signed tens of billions of dollars worth of economic agreements and a tour in, in Central Asia. It's hard to imagine a country, a great power, that has so much economic interest in a region not gaining political and strategic interest. Uh, you know, in the U.S., we, I think we say, I forgot the phrase that, that, uh, that I, I forgot the diplomacy follows the, uh, the flag follows sure. the trade. So, yeah, flag follows trade. So that's maybe what's happening uh, now with China because China's economic role in Central Asia is growing by leaps and bounds. Russia's economy is suffering. It's much smaller than China's and, it, and is suffering. So we're seeing a, a displacement, if you will, in a region of the world that is probably, let's say, a, a shift that's probably as rapid as we've seen in any part of the world at any time. The question is, is Xi Jinping serious about turning Sika into this? Or were his remarks not necessarily Sika-specific? Do they apply maybe to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization? It was a SICA meeting. But if you look at the substance of what Xi Jinping said, talking about regional security, architecture, and defense consulting mechanism, that sounds more appropriate for a smaller, more focused group like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization with China, Central Asia, or most of Central Asia, and, and, um, and Russia. So there's some interesting questions about um, where China wants to, to go uh, on this. Uh, in the new book that just came out yesterday, Secretary Clinton, in her book called Hard Choices about her years as Secretary of State, recalled that in December 2010 in Kyrgyzstan, in a town hall meeting, a journalist asked her about uh, the US policy of reset in relations with Russia. Uh, she said a couple things, but then came down to a really interesting point. She said that it is important for Kyrgyzstan to, quote, have relations with many, but not be dependent on any. Try to balance off all the different relations you have and get the best help you can, she said. That was prescient advice, because indeed the challenge of all the countries in Central Asia is to balance themselves between great powers, and for the smaller countries like Kyrgyzstan, of course, uh, Uzbekistan and, and Kazakhstan are also great powers. Uh, so they all have a, a great balancing uh, challenge there. From Russia's standpoint, it, it asserts political and security power in Central Asia, but lacks uh, economic uh, power. From China's standpoint, China sees increasingly Central Asia as a secure strategic rear, if you will. The more energy China can get from Central Asia and Russia, the more uh, secure China is relative to the capacity of Western navies to interdict energy supplies on the high seas coming to China from Persian Gulf or other parts of the world. So from China's perspective, uh, Western navies have tremendous capability to interdict uh, their strategic uh, economic relationships but in Central Asia, China sees that as a strategic area where the West may not be able to uh, exert so much uh, military influence. So from China's perspective, Central Asia is a key strategic uh, rear and therefore uh, something that quite naturally should take on political and security importance. Now what's the role of the West in all of this? Well, one of the realities is the West has become increasingly estranged from Central Asia. And that will accelerate as NATO forces draw down in Afghanistan. What's the reason? The main reason is the lack of reform. Lack of economic reform, except in Kazakhstan, which has made notable economic reforms, and the lack of political reform, except in Kyrgyzstan, where there are some democratic, so significant democratic reforms. The West increasingly is applying a standard of reform. 
for its relationships with countries around the world, or if you will, democracy, let's say open political and open economic systems. So take Georgia, for example. Georgia is a small country, far smaller, much less strategic consequence than Kazakhstan, but it has a democracy and has become a darling of, of the West. Countries in Central Asia should pay attention to Georgia's circumstance. If countries in Central Asia you know, remain autocratic, uh, it's going to be hard for the West to, to engage in um, multifaceted ways that enable uh, constituencies to be built up in Western countries to support Central Asia. But for example, in Ukraine, there's been a pretty free press uh, every day, somebody can read the Kiev Post online in the West and have a pretty good understanding of the texture of that society. That is very hard with any Central Asian country for people in the West to have a good feel for the texture of societies. Uh, not only is it far away, but it's the political circumstances of Central Asia that make it hard for the West to, to develop a, a meaningful understanding and, and, and develop commitments, if you will. SICA is not helping on reform. OSCE does help on reform, particularly the political side of reform and human rights. OSCE gives honest uh, assessments of elections in countries, for example. Uh, that's not something that uh, SICA or SCO or some of the other organizations are known for. So how are people in the West supposed to react to those kinds of organizations if they're not honest assessments of elections? Those have become very important in, in Western perspective. So I think looking, looking down the road, for countries in Central Asia, SICA can be important if SICA helps them reform. If SICA doesn't help them reform, this will make it harder. And as uh, David Sedney said, you know, the civil society dimension of this is critical, and then the economic openness part of that is critical as well, creating a strong climate for foreign investment. Again, an area where Kazakhstan has done uh, much better than the other countries. What's a lesson for the situation in Ukraine for Central Asia? Well, some people believe that if a country is strong, Russia may be less likely to put pressure to intimidate it. And some others would argue that if you supply weapons to a country like Georgia or Ukraine, that will provoke Russia. But I think the, what we have seen in 2008 with Georgia and, and now, is that it is weakness on the borders of Russia that lead to vulnerabilities and may tempt the Kremlin to exercise uh, power. I think that's probably going to be also true for China, that to the extent countries are weak, China's influence can grow disproportionately. So as the countries look forward to, to SICA, SCO, and other things, from Central Asia's standpoint, it's probably more important to apply tests of reform. How can these countries help them reform? Because that's what they really need. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Bulan? Oh, thank you. I'll keep my remarks brief so as to allow maximum time for questions, particularly to the uh, Deputy Foreign Minister. Um, uh, he referred to the meeting, uh, this meeting being the second meeting at uh, CSIS on this subject. And uh, I was actually at the, at the last me meeting, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister, when Kazakhstan was giving the chairmanship to, uh, 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 to Turkey. And uh, it's uh, good to have you back, and it's good for us to, to focus on this subject in, uh, in Washington, because frankly, um, as the two previous speakers have both uh, underlined, um, there has been insufficient attention to it. Um, the Deputy Foreign Minister referred to uh, this being a <clears throat> young organization. Um, and I'll continue on that uh, uh, theme for a moment. Uh, the original idea goes back to 1992, uh, when President Nazarbayev put it forward. But the first meeting was in 1999. Um, the, uh, so we're talking about uh, what is, in essence, uh, a teenage organization, uh, which is 15 years old, uh, as it were. And, uh, you know, like all teenagers, it has to uh, uh, find its way uh, in the world, and it has to uh, to establish uh, itself as 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 relevant um, in its society. Uh, first, of course, within within its own family, uh, and then within its immediate neighborhood, and then uh, within the the broader society. Um, 
Now, the, uh, um, let's, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's not overlook the fact that the members, which are so diverse, have their own uh, perception of uh, uh, the world and, of course, have their interests. Uh, the chairmanship in uh, past four years ago from Kazakhstan West, uh, Turkey, uh, which uh, is in a unique geostrategic position straddling the eastern and, uh, and, and western worlds, um, uh, a predominantly Muslim country, but of course a member of NATO. Uh, uh, and through the fraternal links between Kazakhstan and, and, and Turkey, uh, the past four years saw uh, the development of the, of the organization. Now it's passed east uh, uh, to a country uh, which is bigger than uh, either Kazakhstan or Turkey, and which has its own um, uh, 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 very broad uh, uh, regional and, and uh, interests and, and interests that go beyond this region. And it remains to be seen how the different perceptions of the, of the member countries uh, and the way in which that they, they reconcile those, those different perceptions and their different national interests, uh, which sometimes clash um, uh, in, in this organization. Um, I mean, like all our, our organizations, it, it will evolve uh, to continue with the theme of a, of a young organization. And it's not clear how it's going to go. Now, we're having this debate in, in Washington, and it's uh, very important for, for Washington as it grapples with a, uh, a series of, uh, of problems. Uh, a new one seems to emerge every day. I mean, the most recent one being the, uh, what's going on in, uh, in uh, northern Iraq uh, with the takeover of Mosul by radical Islamists. Just before that, of course, it was uh, Ukraine a few weeks before that. Uh, who knows what's going to come next? Now, the, the question for U.S. decision makers is uh, uh, how this organization um, it, it fits into its, uh, its broader uh, view of how the international system um, ought to be governed. Now, the uh, SICA has made its way in the, in the international system. Uh, it is part of the international system. How it affects the international, uh, international relations is, re is really going to, de to depend on how it reconciles, as I said, the, the, the different perceptions and the different national interests that the members have and how it actually uh, begins to move ahead, uh, if it can, with the resolution of the, of the problems both within and without. Now, we're talking about the, uh, an organization that's primarily Asian, but of course, um, uh, it, uh, uh, through Turkey, uh, it is uh, extended into the Western community of nations. Through Egypt, it's ex even expanded into Africa. Um, Ukraine uh, is an observer, and Ukraine is going through a very difficult uh, period. And we'll have, just have to wait and see how, uh, uh, if, and hopefully how, uh, SICA will actually contribute to, uh, 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 to, to the resolution of uh, uh, issues within it, it, its borders uh, and without. Now, the, uh, uh, you know, every, uh, it's important to be hopeful about organizations, particularly as they expand. Um, and, uh, and I very much want to be hopeful that uh, Seeker is, uh, is going to make its mark on, on the international system even more than it's uh, uh, made, uh, made its mark so far. But uh, we have to face the, uh, the very real danger that uh, the, uh, the way in which the, uh, the new chairman of the, of the organization perceives itself on the international stage uh, may actually hamper the ability of, uh, of Sika uh, to make its uh, mark in the way that uh, all of us in this room uh, would want. But I want to finish on an optimistic note. I uh, uh, welcome the fact that, uh, that you came to, to Washington with this new message uh, of hope uh, about the, the organization. And uh, certainly at CSIS, we are very hopeful and, and uh, ready to, to cooperate with you in uh, underlining the importance of, of Sika and the way in which the Kazakhstan has uh, not only made this organization come into being uh, by, ha by having first proposed its, uh, it as a, as a vision of the president and then having led it uh, for a number of years. And, uh, and we very much hope that it will actually uh, uh, be a, a useful part of the international system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, those are very thoughtful uh, comments uh, responding to the uh, foreign minister's uh, uh, wide-ranging uh, remarks. I'd like to uh, to start with a question, and then uh, to the to the deputy foreign minister, and then open the floor to uh, additional questions for the 
Deputy Foreign Minister and, and the panel is welcome to uh, comment as well. Um, Your Excellency, in, in Asia, um, uh, we can see that uh, in, in terms of regional frameworks, regional organizations, a lot of the Asian countries view uh, economics as the foundation uh, for security. Uh, so in, in, this, as in essence, uh, security frameworks can't be built uh, without economic engagement. I wondered in that context whether you see a future in SICA for uh, an economic uh, union, um, a free trade agreement within SICA, uh, something um, uh, that broadly based or, or maybe an, an energy based uh, coordination uh, effort. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for your question. And uh, I first and foremost should thank uh, panelists for your valuable. Uh, uh, remarks on uh, uh, SICA and its future. Uh, let me uh, make some comments on your remarks first and then uh, uh, I'll try to answer Absolutely. your question. Well, while organizations are, uh, when organizations are, are created, uh, of course, uh, uh, founding uh, fathers uh, uh, have something in mind. So uh, whether you lay down as a foundation of uh, the international organization principles and which principles you, uh, you uh, uh, put into that organization or you uh, orient that organization uh, uh, to uh, certain results is a matter of choice for founding fathers. So I would say the uh, depiction of uh, the seeker as uh, OEC without humanitarian basket or uh, the, uh, the one lacking uh, humanitarian dimension is uh, uh, well-grounded uh, remarks. Uh, uh, but the very spirit of SICA is based on uh, member states feeling comfortable sitting at one table. You, at SICA meetings, you can see the countries which don't even have diplomatic relations between them sitting at one table and discussing those issues. If you think this is uh, not an achievement, then uh, why don't they have uh, engaged in uh, bilateral uh, talks on the same issues? Well, this is uh, what uh, we actually are trying to do to make uh, member states uh, uh, nation states feeling comfortable in dealing with those uh, pressing issues. I don't exclude in the future that uh, uh, some member states uh, may uh, have uh, other ideas about the future of SICA. Uh, well, you have to be present at uh, the internal uh, 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 discussions at SICA because uh, Different countries have uh, different interests, and uh, the issue of uh, humanitarian dimension is being constantly discussed. But the, uh, one of the uh, founding principles of uh, SICA is a consensus rule. So, so you have to, and this keeps uh, countries comfortable. And uh, well, if in the future uh, countries, uh, all the member states decide that uh, this is an issue uh, uh, to follow, then uh, SICA will develop that way. I don't exclude this uh, uh, either. So Asia is often portrayed as uh, a group of nations which has uh, uh, one blanket, but which uh, see uh, different dreams. So uh, the the role of SICA is uh, uh, not to give uh, one dream for uh, each and every nation, but to have some uh, bridges between those dreams so uh, they interconnect uh, uh, with each other. Uh, as for economic foundation, I believe that SICA uh, 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 has its own niche in Asia, being a, uh, one of the few uh, uh, really pan-Asian uh, structures. It, uh, uh, puts emphasis on uh, uh, political military dimension. But at the same time, there are four other dimensions, uh, 
uh, where uh, CBMs are being developed, uh, uh, economy, uh, environmental dimension, and so on. So uh, everything depends on member states. And uh, if uh, China, uh, the, the, the fear of uh, Chinese chairmanship is, uh, 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 was discussed at, uh, uh, by the panelists, but uh, it's again uh, a consensus rule that uh, 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 rules the seeker. It uh, uh, may be an impediment in the future, as we've seen that in uh, OEC or the UN bodies, but uh, currently, Sikri uh, is based on that rule, and uh, countries are comfortable. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, let me open the floor to uh, questions. Just please introduce yourself, your name, and your organization. We'll bring the microphone uh, here for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jon Alexander. I'm an academic and a CSIS veteran. Uh, proud of. Um, thank the speakers um, for your uh, insights. It triggered a lot of questions, but if I may just ask the Deputy Foreign Minister a question. You referred to the nuclear disarmament, and my question is, uh, what role do you see the CETA and, of course, Kazakhstan in terms of the weapons of mass destruction free zone idea and the implementation of weather in the Middle East or in Asia. Thank you. Well, SICA uh, is open to discussing those issues, I believe. Uh, uh, we've already seen uh, the most recent uh, uh, nuclear weapon free zone uh, was created by uh, largely SICA uh, member states, those are Central Asian uh, countries. Uh, we are one of the uh, most pressing issues on the international agenda in non-proliferation sphere is the creation of uh, Middle Eastern uh, uh, weapon, uh, either nuclear weapon free zone or weapon of mass destruction uh, free zone. So uh, SICA uh, can be an instrument in this uh, 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 area as well, but uh, it's up to the countries to decide. Basically, we are living. Uh, uh, Sika is not a, a, a supranational authority. It cannot impose uh, uh, its will, but uh, it's rather, as I said, uh, the uh, a place where uh, nation states, where uh, uh, national governments feel comfortable of uh, 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 of uh, the dialogue of the issues uh, they discuss, and if uh, the uh, there is a consensus among the nations that uh, uh, WMD or nuclear weapon free zones uh, issues are uh, of uh, importance for them, they will certainly be discussing them at SICA as well. So you're replacing uh, ICBMs with CBMs. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Uh, question here uh, in the middle. Uh, yeah, Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review. Uh, Mr. Deputy Foreign Minister, I think you'll realize from the discussion today that you may have a hard sell uh, for Zika here in official Washington. There are two things that are dominating the, uh, the debate. One is, of course, an increasingly anti-Russian attitude from official circles, and also underneath the surface, also a little uh, anti-Chinese, or at least concerned about chi Chinese as a dominant uh, 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 factor in people's thinking here. So you're going to have a tough time. Uh, in talking about it, perhaps. I, I would like to take issue with something that David Sedney said about the uh, decreasing role of nation states. I think we're entering into an era where globalization has reached a tremendous crisis, maybe a, a cry of final crisis in terms of the economic situation. What we saw in Europe in the European elections, uh, I think, demonstrates that people want nation states back because they feel that only nation states which are subject to the citizenry, whether people are elected or not, the governments are re ultimately responsible to the people. International institutions are not. And I think we'll see a growing role for the nation states. So the fact that all these nations are coming together, I think is very important. And my question is, uh, for the uh, Deputy Foreign Minister, is uh, a little more in the view of the situation uh, relationship with China and Russia. I feel that Kazakhstan 
uh, understands these two powers probably much better than we do and has learned to work together with them and understands the weakness and the strengths. And I think the fact that you are uh, supporting this effort and, and are in the forefront of this effort indicates you have a little bit different view of the role of China in the region, which I think has over the last 10 years has played a tremendous important role with regard to the economic development. One, one portion of the statement on this national, uh, on this security architecture issue, I think, was this uh, idea of um, uh, the fourth point, which had to do with creating the economic basis for development as the basis for security. I think that's absolutely essential in a uh, area where there's still tremendous poverty under development, which is creating really the causes for uh, wars and, and, uh, and discontent. And I think that's an important point that should be underlined. Thank you. Uh, Minister and uh, David, would you like to respond? So. Uh, the question, as I understand, is about uh, uh, our experience of uh, dealing with uh, uh, both Russia and China. Uh, well, uh, we are the country uh, which is not only landlocked, but uh, I would say sandwiched between the two great powers, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, our modus vivendi to, uh, 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 to be successful in, in this part of the world. You have to be constructive. And uh, uh, Kazakhstan actually uh, uh, enjoyed uh, uh, very constructive relations with both uh, countries. And uh, uh, we, what we are trying to do now is to build on uh, uh, the Chinese growth and uh, 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 to use it as a, a vital tool to revitalize our own economy. We are, uh, as a landlocked country, uh, which is uh, seen as uh, a, a disadvantage. But we're trying to uh, uh, change, uh, to transform landlockedness into landlinkedness. So this is uh, a, a concept that uh, we're trying uh, to implement and uh, uh, position ourselves as a, a, a bridge between uh, the uh, growing economies, uh, be it China and Russia or uh, East Asian nations and Europe. Uh, this is uh, 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 what we've uh, done uh, successfully in the past. Uh, but the underlining, the foundation is trust. If you take a look at the statistics uh, back in 1992 after, or 92, uh, 93, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, our bilateral trade with China was uh, something like uh, 50 million dollars a year. So uh, very small uh, trade turnover. Now uh, our bilateral trade turnover is worth of uh, 25 billion and China is uh, 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 the biggest trade partner uh, as a single country. Uh, the biggest in uh, economic terms is uh, the European Union with 50 billion uh, US dollars. But uh, uh, we are separated by only one country, but it's Russia. So it's a big country, and uh, to reach out our customers in Europe, you have to have uh, a good, friendly, and constructive relations with Russian Federation. And this is uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, reaching out to uh, 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 partners outside your immediate uh, 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 neighbors uh, was actually an idea uh, that uh, 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 the principle that guided us in regional integration. And uh, we are now uh, signed the treaty on uh, the creation of uh, Eurasian Economic Union, which is uh, yet another tool uh, for Kazakhstan uh, to reach out to uh, the nations that uh, uh, beyond our borders. Uh, just as a quick follow-up, I think viewers and listeners would like to know, what is the relationship between SICA and the uh, Eurasia Economic Union, or the, I guess it's the EEC, right? Well, uh, I, there, is, uh, uh, there are no formalized relations between the two, okay. but uh, uh, the, I would say the founding principles, uh, uh, we are pragmatic. Mm. We are doing uh, whatever... Uh, uh, is in line with our national interests. So uh, we are members in both. Uh, 
I don't see any other uh, immediate connections between the two. Okay, fair enough. David, did you want to respond to the question? Also? Sure, let me make a couple of points. I think you're right, we disagree, uh, but uh, let me uh, expand on that a little bit. I, as the, the rise of, uh, um, uh, of other systems of uh, governing interactions among pe uh, people and societies uh, that is broadly called globalization, I see as, a, as an overwhelming long-term trend. Yes, there's a short-term reaction against that trend by what I would call localization. Not, rather than a search for a nation state, uh, it, I would say it's localization and the devolution in, in Scotland, for example, the inability of, of uh, the Belgian uh, uh, political system to actually govern effectively because of, of, of local factionalism. And you can look at that in many, in many other places. So I agree with you that there is, this, that there is an emphasis on localization. But I think that's a shorter, shorter term phenomenon than uh, globalization, uh, which I think is giving rise. And it's not just uh, my concern about Sika uh, is not just the humanitarian dimension. I think it's important. I think it's excluding all the other areas uh, uh, except nation state interaction. Uh, and that's where I have a concern. Uh, I th agree that Sika has been uh, a uh, success in bringing people to the table. But I th actually think that making people feel comfortable, uh, if you're comfortable, you don't actually do anything useful, in my view. Uh, so just feeling comfortable, unfortunately, doesn't achieve anything. To achieve things, people have to, in the end, have, are, have to be uncomfortable. You have to do things that are hard. And having Sika move from a place where people feel comfortable for where it is effective, that's a leap that either is going to happen or is not going to happen, and where I think Accommodating, bring, not just accommodating, but bringing into play all these other fact, all these other areas of globalization, would have the power to make SECO really relevant. And as I said, I think it's still a question: Will SECO become relevant or not? Uh, Finally, just one point on the on the nuclear side. If you look at the SECO map, you'll see that there's one area that is not an observer or anything, and that's the area north of that's north of South Korea. Uh, and uh, is, for SECO to be effective in those areas, it's going to have to look at not just uh, countries talking about, uh, again, easy, comfortable subjects like a nuclear weapons-free zone in areas that are already nuclear weapons-free, it's going to have to be able to take a role in areas where nuclear issues are a problem. And that's, I think, the next step for Tsika uh, that uh, I, I, look, I think it can do. I think it can, can do that, but it's going to be hard, not, not comfortable. Was North Korea invited or ex uh, purposely excluded from Tsika? Uh, it was decision of, uh, it is decision of North Korea. North Korean government, uh, if uh, they apply, uh, why not? Thank you. Uh, the uh, woman in the back here, the white jacket. Thank you. Um, I'm Manos Harrison with Last Mile for D. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation. My question goes to um, the minister and um, um, in continuation of what David is talking about. Uh, at the beginning of your remarks, sir, you mentioned a great deal about uh, SICA and security. So is security only seen in the forms of armament and nuclear um, disarmament, or is it seen in the form of youth bulge in the region, unemployment rising, a shortage of skilled workers really to um, get involved with uh, the economic uh, opportunities that may arise, uh, rise of fundamentalism, particularly in Tajikistan and some of the um, SICA members, as well as the absence of CSO. How do you figure this out into the security you're talking about? Thank you. So uh, it's more about uh, creating a favorable environment for uh, member states uh, to resolve their problems. Uh, the most immediate issue was uh, uh, the military political conflicts between the uh, member states. We, uh, the SIC itself has no ambition of uh, dealing with everything because there are so many organizations uh, and uh, we should rather be talking about the synergy between them. It's therefore that SIC uh, uh, signed uh, a memorandum of understanding with uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organizations and uh, I believe uh, uh, this uh, model will uh, be followed by other organizations as well. There is an interest from uh, the part of SICA to, uh, uh, to engage in that uh, uh, interinstitutional relations, but it's not an ambition of SICA uh, to uh, determine uh, or to tackle each and every dimension of security. Okay. 
Uh, gentleman here. Alexander Milikishvili, IHS. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for your presentation, and thank you. I'd like to thank the panelists for your informative remarks. Um, I have a question uh, that is very fairly specific. You mentioned, Your Excellency, the uh, uh, confidence building measures, and I'd like to refer to um, earlier this year the border conflict between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan that ended up in a sh shootout, uh, including use of mortars. Uh, with wounded on both sides, uh, the issue hasn't been resolved. And both members, uh, I'd like to remind the audience here that both of these countries are members not only of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but also Collective Security Treaty Organization. Now, my question to you is how would their membership in SICA prevent this, such border conflicts? Thank, thanks very much. I'm getting uh, tougher and tougher questions. <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, SICA is a dialogue platform. This is, uh, an, indeed, uh, the uh, most important uh, 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 differentiation between SICA and CSTO. Uh, it's, uh, again, I'm reiterating, it's, uh, uh, it's designed to uh, create conditions between the nations to avoid such types of conflicts. Uh, it doesn't uh, want to interfere into the uh, practical competences of uh, uh, other regional organizations. Uh, the uh, conflict between uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan is, I believe, is, uh, is uh, well, it's a minor in terms of uh, the violence, and it's, uh, uh, it can be handled by uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan themselves. There is uh, no need uh, to bring in uh, the uh, 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 outside actors, because this is a conflict, this is an issue that uh, they are, uh, both nations are capable of resolving. Would the panel like to? Say anything about that? No? Okay. Um, I, maybe I could just follow up, uh, Minister, and, and maybe the panel could also address this. I like the uh, constructive sandwich uh, national security policy. I, I understand it intuitively from, uh, from working with the Southeast Asians, you know, the, uh, the need for balance, the need for engagement. Uh, you know, ASEAN itself was formed in 1967 um, in, in large part because the rest, the other ASEAN countries, at that time the four other ASEAN countries, uh, didn't know what Indonesia wanted or, or what they wanted to be. And I think now uh, Asia faces that same question with China. You know, how will China use its power? What does China want to be? And, and it's not clear uh, because on the one hand, uh, China says that it wants to sign a code of conduct um, uh, for resolving disputes uh, in the South China Sea with the ASEAN countries. And, th and then the next move, it um, tows a, a billion dollar oil rig onto the continental coast of, of Vietnam. So I, I wonder if um, you, you believe that uh, you're sort of facing these similar challenges. How do you? What, what can be some, in the, in the confidence building measures, I take your point, I understand it uh, intuitively, but what, um, what sort of accomplishments or deliverables uh, do you hope to see SICA deliver maybe in the next uh, couple of years that, that you can point to where you're actually modifying the behavior of um, the big players uh, in your region, which are clearly uh, China uh, and Russia? Well, uh, I, I can understand uh, uh, your concerns uh, with uh, uh, China uh, and Russia and other big powers uh, in Asia. Right. Well, it's uh, uh, out of our experience of dealing with those nations, uh, uh, the lessons we draw is that whenever you listen to your opponents whenever you uh, take into account in your own uh, decisions their concerns. It's uh, uh, 
a good platform mm. for uh, finding solutions. We were the first uh, nation which uh, agreed upon its borderline with China, and we were only uh, a five years old nation. That's uh, indicative. With some nations, uh, uh, with Russian Federation, we have a, a very good example of uh, 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 solving uh, disputed territories. We just uh, uh, cut them uh, uh, 50 to 50, and in term, uh, when that refers to uh, uh, the oil fields, for example, uh, they are uh, 50 to 50 uh, joint ventures. And uh, we just invite uh, our uh, national oil companies to develop those uh, oil deposits on 50 to 50 share. This is, uh, uh, I believe, the way to overcome. You uh, may, uh, you may make your point uh, 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 continuously without uh, hearing your opponent. But if uh, the desired outcome of all your negotiations is uh, to get uh, to benefit from uh, the uh, uh, the solutions, then uh, you have to find some uh, uh, ways out of that. Then you have to find a common ground. Uh, I we don't see a point in making uh, your case and in winning 100% of uh, the issue. So whenever it's uh, uh, possible for the nation to uh, to find a common ground and uh, to trade something for something uh, disputed for something real at the end of the day, then uh, uh, you may think of that option. Excellent. Young lady here. Thank you. Um, my name is Zhang Hong. I'm from China, Caixin Media. Uh, so, Mr. Deputy uh, Foreign Minister, uh, my question is, uh, what's your observation of Russia's attitude towards um, China's taking leadership in SICA in the recent summit? And, and it's, it seems in, in, inevitable for the two great powers, in, two powers in this, in this organization to have some conflict or friction in terms of agenda setting. So, from Kazakhstan's point of view, how do you resolve this kind of um, conflict um, and to move the agenda forward? And secondly, I would like to ask you about um, the new uh, the Silk Road plan that China is promoting in Central Asia. So how does that um, interact with the Eurasia uh, Economic Union? Is there potential, uh, also potential conflict between the two economic in initiatives? Or could they actually work together? Thank you. Um, the, the Silk Road plan um, promoted by China and the Eurasia Economic Union. Thank you. Well, with regard to your first question, uh, the uh, natural solution could be inviting Russia to be uh, the next chairman, chairperson of the SICA. Then uh, they will be on equal terms, uh, uh, basically. But. Uh, uh, indeed, as uh, uh, you pointed out, uh, I, I, I didn't see any jealousy or I didn't see any unconstructive approach from uh, our Russian partners uh, towards uh, the uh, Chinese chairmanship's agenda. Uh, well, it's, uh, uh, it's a forum, it's give and take forum, uh, consensus based, and uh, no one uh, would blame uh, any member for blocking the decision which it uh, uh, feels uncomfortable with. So uh, Russia uh, uh, may be the next chair or the chair uh, or uh, chair the organization some, sometimes in the future. And then uh, uh, shall we ask the same question with regard to China, whether China is, uh, 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 how China feels about r Russian chairmanship. So it's, uh, it's natural. Uh, and uh, uh, responding or echoing the remarks that uh, uh, we, may, we have to uh, uh, make uh, members uncomfortable to achieve something, then uh, if uh, this is the case, then we can achieve something out of uh, uh, this uh, uncomfortability. <laughs> uh, uh, the, with regard to Silk Road Plan and uh, uh, Eurasian uh, Economic Union, uh, for Kazakhstan, the more 
options we have, the better. We are landlocked country. Again, I underline, uh, 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 once again underline this fact. We are a landlocked country, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, an issue of diversification of our contacts, an issue of uh, accessing uh, 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 different markets. And if Silk Road plan uh, opens up this window of opportunities for us, then we very much welcome it. And uh, the same uh, uh, goes about the uh, Iranian uh, situation. If uh, 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 Iran is uh, the most natural way out for our uh, export, uh, uh, crude oil export, and this has been uh, uh, discussed for so many years, and uh, um, uh, Ambassador Courtney, I believe, uh, uh, has a good experience in, in that issue as well. And uh, if situation uh, 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 ameliorates with uh, regard to Iran, uh, we would be happy uh, to use that direction as well. Uh, David or Ambassador, I'd like to uh, comment a bit. Uh, on uh, Monday, I be believe, uh, here in this room, uh, CSIS had a uh, fascinating discussion among Zbigniew yeah. Brzezinski, uh, Stapleton Roy, and uh, former Australian uh, for, uh, Prime Minister Rudd on, uh, on really exactly these issues. The topic was uh, the China-Russia aspects of, uh, of the meeting in Shanghai. And uh, they discussed exactly what you said. Is it more likely that China and Russia will ally? Or are there, are there, uh, are there uh, tensions between the two? And I think the bottom line is we don't know, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a possibility. In, forms, in terms of Tsika and the role of Kazakhstan specifically and more broadly the Central Asian states, uh, I would uh, stress that I think if Tsika becomes a tool of Russia or China, are of the two of them, then the other countries lose, uh, and then the organization will fail, and that vision that President Nazarbayev laid out will fail. I think there's a structural weakness in SICA, the five-year chairmanship. Uh, you might say the one-year ch rotating chairmanship uh, in the European Union is too short. Uh, I know people have criticized that, but I think the five-year chairmanship is too long. It gives one country too much dominance. Uh, I'll note, for example, that in NATO, there never has been and never will be a US Secretary General of NATO. Uh, the executive director of, uh, of Tika uh, is a very capable Chinese diplomat who I know very well uh, and I have highest admiration for him, but having both the chairman of the organization and the executive director from the same country uh, tends towards that. And then the final point, we haven't mentioned this, but if you, again, if you look at the map there, uh, a member of Tsika that wasn't represented at the top levels because of the recent elections, I believe, is, of course, India. In a couple of years, India will be the number one country in the world in terms of population. India will surpass China in terms of population in a few years. And in all this discussion about China and India and the role of other countries, uh, and I would like to pull back a little bit and look at all of Asia. And uh, you really need to look at the way India will play. And will India be? When will India be the chairman, uh, for example? What role will India play in this? Uh, a t a t another topic for another, another panel. Yeah, very interesting. Ambassador, do you want to say a word? Uh, let me just mention, um, I'd like to endorse the, the Deputy Foreign Minister's um, support for Kazakhstan's gaining the, um, a non-permanent uh, seat on the UN Security Council. Kazakhstan's leadership of SICA, in fact, the initiation of SICA and leadership. Kazakhstan has chaired the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE. Kazakhstan has chaired the uh, Organization of the Islamic, Islamic Conference. Um, probably no country has worked harder to uh, build international uh, credentials than Kazakhstan over such a short period of time, particularly a new country. And so by any um, normal uh, measure, uh, merit-based measure, uh, measure uh, Kazakhstan really is at a point where it deserves to be on the, the UN Security Council. And especially also because Kazakhstan really does work, uh, as the Deputy Foreign Minister has pointed out, to have cooperative relations with everyone. And I think here the West can play a helpful role. Uh, for the countries of Central Asia, balancing China and Russia at times of disequilibrium with China's power growing so much and Russia's political power atrophying a bit in the region. Um, having the West to uh, work with Chinese, uh, with the countries in Central Asia to help them balance will probably be a very helpful thing and will particularly be very helpful in encouraging Central Asians to have cooperative relations with both China and Russia uh, as they go forward. 
Uh, let me make a prediction, which uh, some of you may find shocking. I think a day will come when Russia will want the West to be involved in Central Asia to help offset Chinese power. I think Russia's current policy of trying to exclude the West in Central Asia is a short-sighted policy. The Russians should take a careful look at the correlation of forces and how they're evolving over time. And I believe someday that Russia will have a different view. Excellent. Yeah, I just want to pick up uh, from where Ambassador Courtney left off and uh, raise the, uh, uh, the, uh, the question yet again about uh, um, uh, China and Russia and how uh, Sika will evolve. Now, the Deputy Foreign Minister very ably uh, as a very good diplomat, uh, uh, parried the, uh, the questions that, that I can, as an analyst, uh, uh, raise more freely. Um, I think there's a problem uh, if Russia and, and, and China um, have uh, serious dis disagreements, uh, which are taken into other fora, uh, including, uh, into various fora, including uh, SICA. I think there's a problem if they cooperate very closely. Uh, so uh, trying to keep that balance is, is, is going to be uh, difficult. Um, and following on from Ambassador Courtney's uh, final comment uh, about uh, Russia maybe uh, seeking uh, Western support um, against the rising power of, of China, what we, last, what we in fact saw with uh, Putin's visit to, to Beijing was that having come under increasing pressure from, uh, from the West over Ukraine, uh, he was willing to sign this uh, uh, mega gas deal uh, with the Chinese and, in fact, uh, uh, send a message to, to the West that uh, he had an alternative in, in China, uh, which I think uh, infinitely complicates the, the equation for all of us uh, to look at and for diplomats such as yourself, Deputy Foreign Minister, uh, to grapple with. Time for uh, one or two more questions. I just want to – any others? Thank you again, if I may. One more question. Uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister referred um, actually to, to uh, the issue of the common ground. Uh, do, you, do you see a role for SICA, for example, to try to advance the uh, concept of tolerance, ethnic, racial, religious? In other words, uh, the spirit, if I may use, of Kazakhstan, of Astana, and to follow what, for example, the Pope had done just recently to try to bring together the antagonists and to advance the cause of peace uh, with justice. Indeed, uh, thank you for your question. And indeed, the uh, issue of tolerance uh, is an important one for us, and uh, we, uh, the SICA has already uh, uh, taken that into consideration, and uh, the dialogue among civilizations, among cultures and religions uh, is uh, embodied in uh, the catalog of CBMs. Uh, this is uh, a, a dimension which we are working on, and it's up to the, the, the tools are in the, in the catalog, and it's up to the countries to member states to use them in practice. So we as Kazakhstan are uh, trying to uh, engage in, uh, to actively position ourselves and uh, uh, in international arena, as uh, Ambassador uh, Courtney mentioned, we chaired the OEC, we chaired uh, the uh, ministerial uh, segment of the uh, then Organization of Islamic Conference, but uh, 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 during our chairmanship, it changed its name to Organization of Islamic Cooperation. So, uh, and we had uh, uh, almost uh, identical agenda, uh, which is uh, uh, the, not only uh, security issues, not only the issues of non-proliferation and uh, disarmament, but also uh, the issue of uh, uh, dialogue of civilizations and uh, the issue of uh, tolerance and uh, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, inform you that uh, Astana will host uh, uh, yet uh, another uh, uh, Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions uh, in Astana next year, in uh, 2015. So this is uh, the ongoing uh, effort of Kazakhstan in uh, 
in a, I would say, in a parallel dimension uh, uh, to foster a dialogue between the religious leaders, spiritual in, in a spiritual sphere. And we will be uh, possibly trying to uh, 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 see some intersections between uh, different uh, dimensions of how we can combine uh, our uh, efforts in different uh, areas so as to get the synergy of, uh, 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 out of different uh, 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 initiatives. But well, yeah, the, the, the issue the, uh, 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 is uh, taken care of uh, at SICA and uh, uh, we stand ready and uh, uh, to promote the, uh, the dialogue of uh, uh, civilizations further. A quick follow-up on the, on the trade side. Um, I think Kazakhstan is, uh, currently has its application in to join the WTO. Is that right? Yeah. Um, could you comment on that? And um, uh, why is that important to Kazakhstan? And, and is there any relation to your uh, national security policy and engagement in SICA? Well, uh Kazakhstan, as a, a member of the uh, customs union with uh, Russia and Belarus, right. uh, is already living in under the uh, WTO regulations as uh, Russia is a WTO, WTO member state. So uh, effectively, uh, 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 living in uh, the under the regulation of uh, the WTO, we have uh, no rights of member states. So we are. Uh, we're doing everything possible without any right of, uh, 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 of saying something in, in this regard. So uh, indeed, the uh, uh, WTO accession is uh, a matter of uh, 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 huge importance for Kazakhstan. We would like uh, the Eurasian uh, Economic Union is only one uh, 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 set uh, of uh, 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 efforts uh, trying to open up uh, uh, the world. Uh, we, again, we don't have a seas, access to open seas, and uh, both uh, Russia and China are our immediate seas. Are, uh, they are regarded in Kazakhstan as our seas. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, the way it is. So uh, what uh, we try to do, and uh, as uh, Dr. Hamry uh, pointed out that uh, I've uh, come here to Washington uh, via Paraguay, uh, where we, our delegation attended the 44th General Assembly of the Organization of American States via Cuba, Canada, uh, is uh, uh, our desire to reach out uh, to uh, the uh, faraway partners. We no want to uh, be landlocked in the uh, Eurasian part of the world. We would like to be a member of international community, a responsible member. And uh, therefore, we are so active internationally. We are so active in the foreign policy realm, trying to uh, 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 reach out to different partners, trying to diversify our uh, engagements, uh, diversify our relations. And this is, uh, uh, we believe this is uh, uh, a guarantee of our stable, safe development and uh, the guarantee of our political independence as well. Ambassador. Uh, just to comment on the um, Eurasian Customs Union and then the Eurasian Economic Union, which would begin on January 1st. Uh, the Eurasian Customs Union is relatively protectionist as compared with Kazakhstan's uh, trade arrangements uh, before. So uh, Kazakhstan's accession to the Eurasian Customs Union has generated some unhappiness in Kazakhstan among both consumers as, as well as um, business. Uh, so as the Deputy Foreign Minister points out, it is important that Kazakhstan have a seat at the table in the WTO uh, so that it can influence other members directly and not just be represented by the uh, representative of a protectionist, uh, relatively protectionist customs union. Uh, to some extent, from Russia's standpoint, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union is, is a way to kind of grasp at this point in time uh, in an area where it is losing relative power. 
So as the Deputy Foreign Minister pointed out, China is the largest single country trading partner for Kazakhstan, yet it is now in a customs union with Russia. As time goes on, Chinese trade is, and Chinese economic arrangements are likely to be relatively uh, more important. So the challenge for the future in the WTO, which hopefully Kazakhstan can join soon, will be to work to both encourage uh, participants in the Eurasian Union to become more open and less protectionist, as well as to uh, improve its economic uh, relationships with the Chinese Sea, if you will. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, and I'd like to, you want to say something, Dave? I'd like to uh, uh, thank the uh, Deputy Foreign Minister, who's obviously, um, uh, there's something good going on in Astana when uh, someone who is uh, uh, young, smart, and obviously uh, uh, has got uh, an ability to articulate his country's interests uh, in, in such a way, it's, it's, it's fantastic to hear your your views, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. I think you've you've actually deepened. Deputy Minister. Oh, Deputy Foreign <laughs> you Minister. Elevated so me. I, I just <laughs> I, I do just intuitively imp promote people uh, <laughs> who I'm impressed by, uh, and and I'm impressed by by you. Um, and I and I want to thank our panel, which I think shed some some very good light on the uh, debate, and and I'm raised some important questions, I think about Sika and its future, but. Something that we need to dig into more deeply here in Washington. I think uh, Dr. Hamry was correct when he started the, uh, the panel when he said that um, we don't know enough about Sika. Now we know a lot more. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you all for coming. And uh, please join me in, in thanking our uh, <laughs>